Welcome to World Shared Practice Forum. I'm Dr. Jeff Burns, Chief of Critical Care at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. We're very pleased to have with us today Dr. Robert Graham. Dr. Graham is Senior Associate in Critical Care Medicine at Boston Children's Hospital and Associate Professor at Harvard Medical School. And he's here today because he's also the Founding Director and Director of the Program for Home Ventilation and the Chronic Critically Ill at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. Rob, welcome. Thank you. Rob, uh, 11 years ago, you started our home ventilation program, and it has grown significantly. And I know colleagues around the world have um, increased experience with the fact that uh, advances in pediatrics have allowed children to live longer than ever before, and many of them living with what we call chronic critical illness, and some of them dependent on technology such as uh, mechanical ventilation either in the hospital or in a rehabilitation institution or at the home. What should we know? How should we start to think about this population? And you know, where do we begin the story? You know, I, just, I truly appreciate the opportunity to speak to you and, and to the audience of, of World Shared Practices. You know, it is interesting. I think from the outside, people might think chronic illness is antithetical to acute care. But I think for those of us as providers, we appreciate that actually they are intimately linked, that um, it's not simply that they're a product of our success, although if you look back historically, you know, uh, the advent of inhaled nitric oxide, different ventilator modes, advances in congenital heart disease surgeries, um, the stem cell transplant population, that we are getting patients who are of greater and greater complexity, where we can do more and more, but as a result, there's longer survival and cumulative morbidities. And so the chronic illness population is someone that we're, to an extent, creating, but also supporting. And, uh, and then so today, you know, what I'm hoping to do today is talk a little bit about that relationship, um, describe the population of children with special health care needs and chronic illness in the ICU. Um, maybe we can talk a little bit about what we do know from their outcomes and interventions that can help them when they're in the ICU. And then really explore, you know, what's our role as critical care providers for patients with chronic critical illness? And, you know, from a direct care, research, and actually as we think about it, models of care. And, and coming from, you know, a, a program where I'm trying to help them in their transitions to the outpatient and prevent them from coming back in the ICU, I think those models of care are, are going to be essential moving forward. So, you know, as we sort of think about it, I think the chronic illness population actually shares some characteristics of the acute population that as, pro as critical care providers we're well positioned to take care of. They're patients with multi-system issues. They're patients where technology, whether it's support or monitoring, are often critical. And they present at opportunities where it's a pivotal juncture for families around decision making or acute illness, um, and for those who are interested in sort of medical ethics issues as you are, there are often junctures where we are really, um, we're at a, a, a key nidus for them in terms of uh, decision making. So I think there's a lot that we can learn from them and a lot we can do for this population as we move forward. Um, so, you know, defining the patient with chronic illness, um, chronic critical illness is challenging. If we step back and we say, you know, what do patients with special health care needs or chronic illness, who represents in the general population? Depending on the surveys, um, national and international surveys, it could be as many as 20% of the general population. Now that's quite broad. That's kids with asthma, that's kids with diabetes, that's kids with uh, autism. It's a whole spectrum. You sort of pair that down to those with neurologic disorders, either developmental um, or congenital disorders, um, and it's about 10%. Now, when we're thinking about it in the ICU, we're probably more focusing on the, the complex chronic illness or the medical technology-assisted population. And that's probably somewhere between 1% and 4% of the general population. Um, some sort of jokingly say you know it when you see it. Um, but it, it's probably you know, a fraction of the general population. When you say general population, do you mean the general population in a pediatric a pe hospital? Uh, pediatrics in general, of children across the nation um, or across the world for that matter. So somewhere probably between 1% and 2% are those that we see in the intensive care unit. Now, there's actually a nice study um, as we're thinking about 
working with families, um, thinking about you know who's at risk of coming into the ICU. There was a study out of New York um, where they did a population-based study and compared children with any chronic illness to those who were previously healthy and their risk of an ICU admission during the course of the year. And they actually found that there were about 3.3 relative risk of an ICU admission during the course of a year for someone who had any chronic illness. Now, they actually further divided that cohort and said if you were technology assisted, so someone with a feeding tube, someone with BiPAP dependence, someone with a tracheostomy and a ventilator, any sort of technology dependence actually had a 373 relative risk of an ICU admission during the course of a year. So these are patients who are at greater risk for coming in. And when we're talking to families, I think it's something that they, to make them aware of. There are probably multiple drivers for that, but it's still something to sort of think about. It was actually early in my fellowship training that I actually went about and I actually looked at our own population here in Boston and said, you know, what proportion of our patients admitted on any given day to the ICU had chronic illness, or um, I actually tried to keep it relatively narrow, um, and just said congenital neurologic disabilities, so born with some abnormality of their central nervous system or peripheral nervous system that made them significantly technology dependent or had chronic illness. In fact, at that time, which is now over 15 years ago, it was 25% of our patients. Um, I did not include children with congenital heart disease, did not include children with acquired illnesses. Um, so a large proportion of our patients. Um, unless we sort of think it's unique to here in Boston, that yes, we, you know, we're a referral center and perhaps we're seeing more, this has actually been shown all around the world. Um, we look at uh, studies out of Washington, D.C., out of Glasgow, Scotland, uh, studies out of Greece. And for me, interestingly, there was a study from Croatia that used the same methodology that I used, um, and they followed up a couple of years later and found that more than 40% of their patients had congenital neurologic disabilities. So it's something I think all of us as a critical care community internationally are seeing. There are probably, again, multiple drivers for that. It's technology support. It's interventions we can provide. And there's probably changes in sort of how we approach these patients from, from an ethical and decision-making uh, perspective. Um, why are they here? Now, that's sort of a natural question. Um, these children have probably some inherent vulnerabilities, but it also probably reflects to an extent um, the structure of our health care provision. So, the children will often come in for routine care, so they have to be in the ICU because they are ventilator dependent, and the ICUs are where we support children with ventilator dependence. Um, it may be that they're not sort of uh, sick acutely, but they have to come in for a routine surgery or some other monitoring um, procedure, uh, nutritional adjustments, what have you, that that requires them to be in the ICU setting. So sort of routine care may be provided in the ICU setting. Then there's subacute care. Maybe they do have, you know, an intercurrent illness. They've got RSV, they're BiPAP dependent, and they are too sick to be on the ward service, they're too sick to be home, and hence we're, um, you know, their sort of backup for that. Um, or it may be that they're actually recovering from something significant. Maybe they've had a big surgical uh, procedure, and actually the level of care that they require is um, necessary to be in the ICU. And then there's the sort of standard acute care. I mean, these children can still have issues that any other child might have and that they can develop ARDS from infections. They can be involved in traumas, um, you know, other issues that come up. And so, you know, they sort of run the gamut in terms of illnesses while they're with us. But it's possible that each of those have different needs. If they're in for routine care, we need to tailor how we provide that as opposed to how we approach them when they're there for ARDS and differentiate those circumstances. So interestingly, despite the fact that this is a large number of patients, they're here frequently, we don't know a lot about them. Um, there's been some studies looking at outcomes and the challenge is probably that there's no uniform definition um, of children with special health care needs or children with chronic illness. Um, but what people have done is sort of looked at small groups, looked at children with Down syndrome, looked at children with chronic epilepsy, and looked at those groups to say, you know, what are their outcomes in, in the intensive care setting? There have been some limited intervention trials, uh, patients with neuromuscular conditions, Duchenne muscular dystrophy, spinal muscular atrophy, where we've found that implementation of rigorous protocols or protocolizing sort of respiratory care, which is, makes them most vulnerable, that optimizing that and being rigorous in our approach to it has actually improved their outcomes.
think intuitively that makes sense, but it's hard to look at that group. It's a very heterogeneous group when we think of patients with cerebral palsy are not the same as those with hypotonic muscle disorders, or patients with epilepsy are not the same as children with congenital heart disease and chronic lung disease um, who are ventilator dependent. So for us to do rigorous evaluations may be challenging, but I think it does force us to sort of think about how can we approach them sort of systematically. So um, Dr. Graham, uh, you know, with all your experience, how should we think about um, the complexity of care required for children with technology dependence? And in particular, um, I suspect colleagues around the world, uh, like me, have some sense that they're admitted more frequently, but what does the data show about how frequently children who are technology dependent, they've got a tracheostomy tube, they're uh, on mechanical ventilation, they have a feeding tube, what does the data show about how frequently those children are readmitted and their length of stay compared to the average pediatric patient? The group of patients with chronic clinical illness has been looked at with regards to length of stay. Um, so um, groups actually internationally have looked at this and, and there are various definitions in terms of long lengths of stay. Um, you know, we think of most of our patients in the ICU as turning over relatively frequently. but. Um, what we have seen is that patients with chronic critical illness tend to stay longer. Some of the original studies, um, which were actually out of Washington, D.C., defined it as 12 days or more, and they basically took three standard deviations beyond their normal length of stay and said, by definition, those patients are long lengths of stay. If you had any chronic illness, you were, in fact, at greater risk. But what's interesting, and we'll look at this um, slide um, from uh, Marson and, and their group out of Washington, D.C. As we look at it, the things that actually put you at greatest risk for a long length of stay were the technology dependence itself. So patients who had gastrostomy tubes, patients who were TPN dependent, patients who were ventilator dependent, or had a tracheostomy tube were at significantly greater uh, uh, risk of long lengths of stay than any other patient population. Interestingly, if you're there for a post-operative stay, you had a shorter length of stay, but if you'd had a prior ICU admission, presumably a lot of our patients are readmits, um, you actually have a higher risk of a long length of stay as well. So it's, it's fascinating as we sort of think about it. By definition, we are adding to their technology support, but as a result, they also stay longer, and when they return, they tend to stay longer. Um, when I actually looked at our patient population, um, what I also found is that the majority of these patients are cared for in the home care setting, and that one of the things that we see is that um, their prolonged length of stay may be that we need to establish supports in the home care setting. And that's something that, as I think about models of care, and we'll talk about in a little bit, um, we need to sort of consider that as one of the factors in how we provide this care. The other interesting thing as we think about length of stay is things that they're at risk for when they're with us. Um, even if you modify uh, for baseline organ dysfunction and otherwise, these children are at greater risk of medical error. A nice study by Tony Slonim and his group actually showed that patients who had any sort of technology dependence, um, when you looked at per discharge uh, rates of medical error, had markedly increased um, uh, risks. That it, compared to the general population without technology support, they had an incidence of 11 uh, medical errors per 100 discharges versus approximately two for the general population. And those discharged to long-term care facilities or those discharged with home care nursing, again, had much higher risks of uh, medical error while in the intensive care population. So it, it's one of the things that it may reflect their underlying complexity, it may reflect that they have complex medical regimens at baseline, and it just may reflect that they're sicker while they're there. Now, interestingly, when we think about are they sicker when they're with us, when you actually look at some of the other data, looking at MOD scores and vPICU assessments, what they've seen is, in fact, actually, they don't really have greater organ dysfunction coming in nor do they necessarily have different mortality rates, and that, that varies from study to study uh, when you control for various factors. But what is evident is that at discharge, they have greater technology support than when they came in. And um, it, it does speak to the fact that there's this sort of cumulative effect for these patients and perhaps making them at greater risk as they're leaving than when they came in as well. People have actually looked at 
the readmission rates. And this is actually, I think, something that's actually relatively fascinating. When we think about um, preparing families, preparing ourselves, and setting up uh, programs for, for follow-up, um, Jay Berry, who's a phenomenal health services researcher, um, has looked at it, various national databases and looked at patients following their tracheostomy, the first discharge following tracheostomy. Followed them for five years and said, um, what's the likelihood of a readmission or what's the rate of readmission and why? Um, interestingly, in the cohorts that he studied, found that the rate of readmissions ranged from zero over five years to 44 readmissions in a five-year period for, for, uh, for the outliers. Now, there's something wrong if you're being readmitted 44 times in five years. It speaks to something about you as the patient, but probably something else with regards to systems issues. Now, that's an outlier, but it does say that this is frequent, and we need to prepare families for that. Now, some other studies, um, Sheila Kuhn and Tom Keens out of Children's of LA or Los Angeles, who actually have a, a very sizable home ventilator program, have looked at their patients specifically and said, you know, what's the risk of being readmitted and why? And interestingly, about two thirds of the patients that were readmitted uh, in a year period were actually respiratory related perhaps not a surprise, or direct tracheostomy device related. And so there may be an educational component that needs to be reinforced either with the families or with home care providers. But what I actually took away from their, their study, which was interesting, is that when they did their multifactorial uh, analysis, it was actually a change in the management of that patient's supports within the seven days before that initial discharge that put them at higher risk of readmission. So that's to say, basically, there needs to be a, a sort of realignment of how we care for these kids as they're preparing for discharge. That any change may be a red flag that they're not ready to go or that they're going to be at higher risk for coming back. And that, you know, it, it, it sort of supports the need maybe for a transition to rehabilitation or just a realignment of our sort of care paradigm and saying we're at a place where we need sort of the status quo for a period before they go home. So I think it's helpful to, as we think about them in that sort of care paradigm. Are they here for acute processes? Are they here for subacute? Are they here for routine? And, and maybe they need to shift along that spectrum during the course of their ICU stays. Rob, you know, now I'm, as you're talking, I'm realizing, you know, this is uh, one of the discrete populations in the ICU where we think about them, not about their disease process, as you said, because there are many disease processes that lead to chronic critical illness and children with special health care needs or children with technology dependence. But rather, what defines them is the process of care. Um, and so what are the different ways we should think about the process of care that we provide to these children? Yeah, I think it is important to differentiate them from a previously healthy child. I think they have their own unique needs, but the families also have their own needs. And Part of it is, again, born out of what they are required to do at home and when they come back and the circumstances under which they come back to us. So I think there's a historical barrier that we need to overcome, and, and some of that is actually professional attitudes. So there are actually a lot of conditions we support now in the ICU that we previously would have redirected care on. And I think depending on where you are and the resources and um, individual providers perspectives, I think we need to realign to where we are now and actually where we're going forward as we think about sort of actually research advances, genetic therapies and things like that. You know, traditionally, um, patients with severe myelomeningocele, spina bifida, in fact, uh, depending on where you were, wouldn't have had shunts placed. You know, when we think back 20 years ago and, and sometimes actually even more recently, and then certainly 30 years ago, that they would have been sent home to, for comfort measures and, and otherwise. Patients with Down syndrome historically would not have necessarily had, depending on you know, the institution they were at, repaired congenital heart disease or intestinal disorders. Um, and we can extrapolate that to a number of populations. And so I think there's you know, sort of professional attitudes that sometimes families still confront and that we need to appreciate that. I think it's also helpful to sort of think about what we value in our own outcomes in the ICU. You know, our goal as intensivists is to make the child as good as they were when they came in. You know, you want the child to survive with sepsis and to be able to go back to school and go on to college and, and sort of move forward with their lives. The same with ARDS and otherwise. Um, but we also have to appreciate the fact that 
the children coming in with chronic critical illness have a different baseline. And you know, our objective is, yes, perhaps to make them better, but at least to have them have the level of functionality that they did coming in. And so um, we have to be cautious about what we sort of, where we set our expectations. We have to align with the families a little bit more with that. The other uh, interesting thing is that we sort of think about the, the different sort of paradigm is what I like to call the reconfigured parental role. These are families who are coming in, and for some of them, if you have a child at home who's ventilator dependent, maybe uses uh, parental nutrition and otherwise, or has very complex regimens for anti-epilepsy therapies, you know, they are running an ICU in their living room or actually in their bedrooms. And so what they are charged with, what we charge them with to do at home, is then completely, there's a complete disconnect between what they're allowed to do in the ICU. Um, you know, I actually have a mother who uh, wears a t-shirt that says, I'm not an MD, I'm an MOM, I'm a medically oriented mother. And I, I've actually, uh, you know, she wears that to be provocative, but also to get people to engage with her, to say, look, I'm a resource. I know what's going on with my child. I know what's happened with him. I know what works for him. And in fact, I've actually suggested she could substitute MD for respiratory therapist or physical therapist or RN. She kind of does it all. And so I think we would actually be negligent if we didn't tap into that as a resource. Now that's a caution. We have to differentiate what's acute illness and you know what, what that role is. But it can also be disabling to the family to feel that their understanding is not appreciated or uh, even recognized at all. And so I think that's one of the things as we think about these kids in the ICU, we have to sort of engage the families a little bit more. Um, I actually did a study uh, several years ago. We did a qualitative study and interviewed a bunch of parents um, with children with special health care needs when they're in the ICU. And what they wanted you to know, they want you to know what their child's like at the baseline. They put up pictures for a reason. And they also appreciate that their children, especially those with a lot of developmental delays, often aren't themselves when they're in the ICU. They shut down. They sort of uh, you know, play possum, as it were, that they're very different when they're at home than they are in the ICU. And they, they want us to know that. Um, they like us to integrate and bridge multiple services, which I think we are. We're the nexus of multiple services in the ICU setting. You know, whether you need an endocrinologist, whether you need um, a respiratory uh, support services, whether you need a metabolic uh, provider or cardiologist, everything comes through us, and they want us to do that. They also want us to pull in the primary care providers. They want us to pull in patient, uh, you know, their teams who know them as outpatients. Um, and to help facilitate both in terms of informing us, but also helping in that transition. What was also interesting is the families almost uniformly said that, you know, the PICU or the ICU setting is not a respite for them. We might perceive it as, oh, this is a time you can rest, we'll take care of your child. But in fact, it's an opportunity for them to, A, learn more, that they're standing vigil and trying to watch what we as providers are doing at the bedside so they can duplicate that at home to prevent from coming back. Um, to also, as I said, inform us as to what is helpful. And it may also be an opportunity for them to catch up on everything else that they can't do when they're providing this complex care in their living room. Um, it's a high stakes learning environment is what we like to say is that, you know, they really want to improve their care so they don't have to come back in. What was interesting though, it, it's a heterogeneous group and you know we want to be sort of patient and family centered and we talk about engaging families on rounds, but in fact, you know, as we expect with all of our families, some people like that and some people don't. Um, I don't think we should assume that those with chronic illness want to be involved in every aspect. Um, they appreciate that when they're at an academic center like ours, that there are other objectives to rounds. There's teaching. There's exploration of differential diagnoses. That may not help them emotionally, um, and they may want us to come back and work with them on an individual basis. And so um, one size doesn't fit all, um, which I think is helpful when we're thinking about, you know, broad strokes of who is this population. The other thing that's interesting is that the families also appreciate the fact, and it's a stressor for them, that they don't want to be in the ICU. That if they're there for routine care, they're there because their child has to have some surgery, but they're not critically ill, that whether it's a degree of guilt or just sort of appreciation that there are other resources that could be diverted elsewhere, that if there was a place that they could be that wasn't the intensive care, they would rather be there. And so I think it's helpful when we think about how does the parent fit into our ICU and their child, uh, something to think about.
The other thing that's interesting, um, and this has been looked at by uh, Rose Steele, who's a health services researcher out of Canada, and Jane Serwent um, out, of Cal um, out of California, is these children have idiosyncratic clinical trajectories. We know that with other patients, um, it's hard to predict what's going to happen with them. It's probably even more so in chronic illness. We have a sense as to, oh, they have a downward trajectory, or, oh, we know their hearts are failing, or they're likely to have another breakthrough of their, of their epilepsy syndromes. But we're really bad at predicting that. Um, and in fact, actually, what several of these studies have shown is that um, when they're relatively well, families of children with chronic critical illness actually sort of withdraw from medical care. They engage those who they need to, um, but in fact, actually, they're not anticipating another illness in the sense that they don't think that their child's necessarily at a high rate of mortality or mor morbidities. And what happens when they come into the ICU is it's almost an, an assault to them emotionally that they talk about it as being dropping off a plateau, that they're isolated, and then they come in and it's just, it's, it's a greater challenge for them emotionally. And that's something that I think we often confront um, with families is that our assumption is that they must know their child's sick. Look at how much support they're on. But in fact, actually, it's just part of their daily lives. So I think we have to sort of reframe our paradigm with that as well in terms of when we're talking to the families and not making those assumptions that, of course, they're sick. And you should have expected this. So Dr. Graham, you know, could we talk about the role of uh, assessing a child's quality of life in making decisions for that patient? And in particular, um, as you well know, um, in medical ethics, uh, what we're taught is that when uh, doctors and nurses are thinking about um, decisions for that child, that we should be careful not to use what's called a comparative quality of life standard. Uh, that means I'm looking at an eight-year-old who's got a tracheostomy and chronically ventilated and has neuromuscular weakness and so is in bed all day. And what we're taught is do not use a comparative quality of life standard. Don't reference that eight-year-old against all other eight-year-olds who uh, probably are not traked and ventilated and are up and moving around, but rather we're told to use a non-comparative quality of life standard, meaning don't compare him to anyone else but his own quality of life. What was it like before uh, this hospitalization? Um, what enjoyment did he get? And is that still present? Um, and it's borne out also in studies with uh, people who have spinal cord injuries, and I believe this happened to Christopher Reeve, yes. uh, who played Superman in the movies, that when you ask a previously healthy person who now has a spinal cord injury, a high cervical spinal cord injury with quadriplegia, what's your quality of life? In the first three, four, 12 months, they rate it compared to what they were like yes. when they were healthy. But then after, 12 months, they start to reference it to their life as it is, and they suddenly the, their rating of their own quality of life goes up. Is, is the same thing true in your experience, and is that the way we should think about this? Yes, I, I think that's actually an excellent point. Some sociologists have talked about this, that it's the parent's response to challenges. And you know what we think of as burden of care, in fact, actually is not perceived as a burden, whether it's, you know, how many times do you need to suction a child during the day or, or attach a, a, a gastrostomy tube feeding or otherwise, that that's not perceived as a burden and hence it's not compromising their quality of life. Um, and so how we assess that in the ICU or what we assume or impose upon them in terms of our judgments is not necessarily what they're experiencing. Um, we actually looked at and did a, a number of surveys with our home ventilator patients. We used a battery of, of uh, assessments, including one, um, the, the Child Health Ratings Inventory Scale, and found that all of our families actually reported a decreased um, quality of life across domains relative to the general population. As you're saying, they can't necessarily be compared to that. That said, it was at a pretty constant level. And when we actually looked at the subdomains, which was interesting, is that there were stressors that markedly decreased their quality of life. But what was relatively preserved was the domain around family experience, that family life was the domain that was relatively preserved. And so that all of the efforts that they make in terms of daily care, changing schedules, all the coordination issues, and the stressors that they might have financially and otherwise, was to preserve that family life and that their quality of life measures around that 
and the experiences in the home were actually relatively preserved. So I think you're right. We have to be really cautious about what judgments we make and how we counsel families about what the meaningfulness is of these interventions when they're leaving the ICU. Um, it's hard, and I, any given family to refer them to say, oh, you should go see this family because this is what they've experienced. They are drawing on their own resources. But I think you're right. Once you get home and what we see as I said, they often withdraw when they're not acutely ill. And it's not that they're withdrawing because they, they don't want to engage, it's that they don't need to, that they're very self-sufficient. They're going about leading their lives as anyone else would. And this is just part of their daily life. Is it more than you might need to do with an otherwise healthy child? Absolutely. So I think that is a, a major consideration when we're counseling families and when we're responding to them at the bedside in the acute setting. I'd like to turn now and ask colleagues around the world the question. In your response, could you please first leave your city and country location? And the question is this. At your hospital, if a child with technology dependence, for example, a child who has a tracheostomy and is dependent on mechanical ventilation, is admitted to the hospital for a small routine procedure, would that patient automatically be admitted to your intensive care unit because they're dependent on mechanical ventilation? Or is there, are there other resources, other units outside of intensive care at your hospital where that child would be cared for? We're back now with Dr. Rob Graham. As we move forward, I think there are a lot of things that we can do. I think we can reframe our paradigms, and there's interest both in cardiac intensive care, general uh, pediatric intensive care, and other uh, models saying, how can we frame our role in the acute care setting, transitional settings, home care settings, and we'll talk about my personal biases for the role of, of intensive care providers, but um, how do we want to think about this group? I think including children with special health care needs in research protocols is going to be crucial going forward to improve their outcomes. Now, um, the POLICI group, the Pediatric uh, Acute Lung Injury and Sepsis Investigators, now actually have uh, in some of their protocols lots of discussion about how do we include patients with premorbid conditions and other comorbidities in these rigorous studies. Um, they aren't going to be of large numbers in a uniform group, but how do we account for them in multifactorial analyses and are there groups that we need to pull out? So I think it's going to be crucial as we sort of think about them going forward because they may have unique needs and they may be at higher risk for some things but not others. So I, I think including these groups rather than excluding them will be helpful for us as providers but also for these families. Um, the other thing um, that I think is actually probably even more important is that even if we're not doing research with them, is that we're keeping up with the research on their conditions. As I said, we're in an era where gene-targeted therapies and gene replacement therapies are a reality. And as a result, what was the natural history for many of these conditions, spinal muscular atrophy, um, Kriegler-Najjar, um, myotubular myopathies, a number of conditions are now being targeted for gene replacement or gene modification. And so what we counsel families about our expectations may be very different than the realities going forward. And so um, it's challenging as on a case-by-case -case basis, but I think we need to look to our resources from the other consultants and then educate ourselves with these sort of advances because the families are going to be coming in with it. And as a result, they're going to be looking to us to A, know this already, but B, help them and guide them in terms of what other supports can we provide to help them get the most benefit from these new technologies and these new interventions. Rob, uh, among um, the research issues, of course, as you've said, it's self-evident that this population uh, should be studied like every population uh, in pediatrics, and in particular, some of their health services needs, as you're doing, to find out what are the interventions that they need, um, how are they best provided, in what environment, and what's the cost to do that, is all research that you're actively doing, so-called health services research. But could we talk for a minute about this other research that you're involved in? And that's this amazing breakthrough uh, for children with spinal muscular atrophy. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, it's fascinating. And, and in fact, actually, I think they go in parallel. And it's one of the reasons that I'm really interested in children with special health care needs and chronic illness is that for any individual condition, 
there's a lot of burgeoning research um, condition specific. So spinal muscular atrophy, for instance, is actually at the forefront of gene therapy. Um, there are actually gene replacement trials that are ongoing. And most significantly, in the last year or two, there's been an approval of an FDA an FDA approved drug, nusinersen, brand name is Spinraza, um, which actually is targeting, for lack of a better term, a backup gene, the SMN2 gene. It's um, a duplicate, although incomplete copy or defective copy of the spinal motor neuron one gene that's missing in children with SMA. This actually therapy sort of patches over this, this error that's in this backup gene and allows the children to produce the normal spinal motor neuron protein that would otherwise be absent. Now, fascinating in terms of what this means for them clinically, for the infants that are diagnosed, it may mean that they're able to sit, they're able to stand, they may even be able to walk, and they may not have the cumulative morbidities that we would have otherwise associated with this condition. These are infants with spinal muscular, muscular atrophy, atrophy type 1. Type 1, yes. Children who we would otherwise, when we look at their natural history, 90% of them would have died by the time they were two years of age, certainly would have been dependent on BiPAP and likely transtracheal support if that's what the family's decisions were going to be. But now they may have potentially a normal lifetime expectancy with a, a condition like uh, SMA with the advent of these new gene-targeted therapies. With and without BiPAP, there's varying responses, but dramatically changing the, what we would consider the natural history, and hence altering what we need to be aware of and how we counsel families. Now, I do think the health services research efforts and the clinical efforts have to go in parallel because, as I said, we need to have these children healthy enough to benefit from these. So there might be decisions that we're working with them around BiPAP support, enterostomy tubes for feeding to help support the child while they get the benefits of these um, therapies, but truly revolutionizing the potential for these kids and hence the care and the other things that the families are having to sort of confront. Um, it is remarkable, and, and I see this is going to be playing out in a number of conditions. Now, for the older patients with SMA type 2 and type 3, again, they are probably changing, disease modifying dramatically, and hence children coming in previously for extensive spinal instrumentation may not necessarily need that. Their neuromuscular scoliosis may not be as dramatic. Um, lots of other things that we need to sort of think about, as I said, educate ourselves as we go along, and it truly is one of the exciting things about working with the population of chronic critical illness is that um, as we look at these new avenues of research that they're going to drive our care, they're going to drive parental decision making, and maybe even alter our care models for them going forward. I have my personal biases in terms of what the role of a critical care provider can be. Um, as I said, I run a home ventilator program and we literally go out and do home visits, and we go see them in their homes. We make sure that the supports are set up. We're there as a resource when they're sick. We work with the primary pediatricians, and I think while not a model that everyone would want to implement or necessarily should implement, it has its role. And I think with more technology, telemedicine capacity, I think the ICU really is a nexus where we can sort of extend our expertise to help primary care pediatricians and, and families directly and home nursing agencies. I do think the other thing that we need to, we'd be negligent if we didn't acknowledge it, we're supporting a group of aging patients and that these types of services aren't going to be in place as they transition to adult services. And so as pediatric institutions, we need to start to partner a little bit more with our adult providers and look to say, how can we transition? Because the older patients are going to start having comorbidities that are not from their primary disorders, but from just aging. And, you know, as a pediatrician, um, we're not necessarily oriented to that and may miss things as we move forward. So as we think about children with special health care needs, I think there's some things we can optimize in their care. Is that we have to acknowledge that they have a quality of life, whether it's comparable to what we would think of for the otherwise healthy kid. That's, that may not be the case, but the families want us to know that they are living good lives in the community. Um, we need to have early discussions regarding decisions. So at the time of a new diagnosis, if you have a child with spinal muscular atrophy or a congenital heart lesion, is talk about what interventions might you expect um, and what are the options. Um, I think we, as we're introducing technology to sports, is talk about the risk benefits. 
you know, that putting a tracheostomy in is fraught with challenges going forward, but those may be outweighed by the benefits that they provide. And we also need to talk about the question of reversible, um, you know, reversibility, is that, you know, if the condition improves, perhaps this can come away. If the quality of life without it or with it is not what they would expect, is it something that can be withdrawn? And as you know, as a medical ethicist, withholding and withdrawing, you know, from an ethical and legal perspective is, is often equivalent. But from an emotional perspective, it's actually very challenging. And so I try to be as transparent with families about these decisions early on. A multidisciplinary approach, again, pulling in clergy, family support, social workers, our own colleagues, consultants, I think is actually helpful for these families when they're in the ICU for any reason um, to make sure we're providing a sort of comprehensive approach. Engaging non-acute providers at acute times, so pulling in the primary epileptologist, pulling in the primary care doctor, their primary cardiologist to say, how is this different? What should our goals be? Um, you know, it's crucial that we calibrate ourselves to what their baseline is and, and what, to, what their potentials are going to be. Um, we have to acknowledge the parent-child relationship, as I talked about. You know, they have the longitudinal perspective that we don't, that we have these episodic uh, interventions with them. They're coming in for an illness, they're coming in for a surgery, but the families have a longitudinal perspective that we don't have. And so that's another resource that, um, you know, we need to maintain uh, when we look at them. The transitions in care whether it be transition to adult providers, whether it's transition to an intermediate care unit, transitions to a rehabilitation service, transitions to a long-term care facility, we probably need to take a more active role in that to make sure that there aren't things that are missed and place them at higher risk for return to the ICU. Um, those stressors are not um, easily measured, but certainly not negligible um, and something we th need to think about. I also, in general, how we approach patients, we don't want to ignore faith. Many of these families have an enormous amount of faith in, in various denominations, and whether you're comfortable with your own faith and belief systems or not, the families often rely on that. And so I think it's something, as we do with all of our patients, you need to sort of work with them and, and their community supports in decision making. And then ultimately, I think we also need to model you know, compassionate care for these patients as we would with any other patient population in the ICU for our trainees and our colleagues. And I think that'll be crucial in terms of improving their outcomes and communication. Um, as we know, communication is critical when it comes to outcomes and minimizing uh, medical errors and, and optimizing outcomes. Rob, I wonder if we could turn now to home ventilation programs. Um, they exist in the United States and uh, in Canada um, and indeed throughout the world. Um, what does the literature show about uh, really the effectiveness or the outcomes of home ventilation programs? So um, it's a growing body of literature. As I said, the health services research world is really trying to look rigorously at cost, at resource utilization, at patient-centered outcomes, not just morbidity and mortality anymore. Um, that said, if we look back at um, Jack Downs program out of Philadelphia, they showed over decades actually significantly reduced mortality rate um, with a rigorous, well-defined home ventilator program. Um, when we think about other models, um, telephone follow-ups from the ICU have shown, even in the adult and pediatric worlds, improved satisfaction from the, the patient and family perspective. Um, there's also actually a fair bit of research um, when we look at adult ICU follow-up programs have shown marked reduction in unplanned readmissions and unplanned ED visits within a 30 and 90 day um, period after that sentinel uh, discharge. Um, the implications for that in the adult world are huge, obviously. You're looking at COPD, you're looking at heart disease, you're looking at stroke follow-up. Um, you know, those numbers are quite large. The implications for our patients in pediatrics are smaller in number, but probably have the same uh, magnitude in terms of importance for the families and outcomes and certainly costs when we think about them. In our own program, we've actually looked at um, resource utilization and found that implementation of our telemedicine program, our off-hours pager and, and telephone encounters for weekends, nights, holidays, have actually averted numerous uh, ER admissions, hospitalizations, and otherwise, because these families and these children don't have resources in their local communities that are necessarily comfortable. 
Um, and if they wind up in community emergency rooms, then it's an automatic referral to a tertiary care center or a quaternary care center like ours, because that's in fact where they receive the rest of their care and for those who are comfortable with those types of complex care issues. And so there actually is a fair bit of evidence to suggest that there's a lot of improved clinical outcomes as well as reduction in cost with these home ventilator programs. And as we look at models of care and working on payment models and um, you know sort of more national programs, I think this is where things are going to be moving forward in terms of how do we align our care and cost and, and services. I'd like to turn now and ask our colleagues around the world a question. In your response, could you first please leave your city and country location and the question is this, does your pediatric hospital have a dedicated home ventilator program? We're back now with Dr. Robert Graham, Senior Associate of Critical Care at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. So one last question. Um, I would think in the age of wearables, um, my iPhone that's tracking my walking, my distance, but you know, if I had a watch on, it's measuring a lot of uh, you know, my vital signs, that we're in the era where you can monitor these patients at home as carefully as if they were in the uh, ICU. Are you doing that in your home ventilation program? You know, Jeff, that's actually a great uh, idea, and it actually is something that we are moving forward with, and I think a lot of people are experimenting with. Now, the challenge is, obviously, um, distance, where telemedicine and wearables and otherwise actually overcome that. Now, we are using telemedicine regularly. I think the wearables have a lot of potential. The challenge is, is I think we're going to have to individualize that. As I said, it's a very heterogeneous group. So the patients with congenital heart disease versus those with epilepsy, those with cerebral palsy and complex respiratory needs, or the patients with spinal muscular atrophy are even within their own groups quite diverse. So I think the wearables and the downloadable uh, data that we get from ventilators and otherwise actually are going to be hugely important as we move forward. And this is one of the challenges I, I have as a provider and my colleagues who are interested in home ventilation and monitoring, um, this is what we need to do to move the field forward for better care and to prevent readmissions and to allow the families to live a little bit more comfortably. You know, having those types of supports that are portable allow them to go to the grocery store, to go on vacation, to go to school, um, where there's a degree of non-invasive monitoring so that they don't feel as though they're overly medicalized any more than they already are, but also know that they're still being monitored and you know going to prevent those unplanned uh, events and readmissions. Well, Dr. Rob Graham, um, I speak on behalf of my colleagues, uh, both here uh, who work with you every day and colleagues around the world. Uh, thank you for this wonderful overview of um, really how care has advanced uh, for this population of special needs children. And um, I personally thank you for your personal efforts over the last 20 years uh, to provide such wonderful care for uh, countless numbers of families throughout New England. Thank you, it's been a pleasure.